Thank you for joining us today for an important discussion about disparities in cancer care and outcomes. I'm Anna Gorman. I'm a senior correspondent at Kaiser Health News and California Healthline, and I'm pleased to have here with me today Dr. Ken Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is the director of the Institute for Population Health Improvement at UC Davis. He has worked in healthcare for decades in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. He's a professor, has written hundreds of academic articles and reports. He was California's top health official for many years and ran the VA healthcare system. So let me set the stage, Dr. Kaiser. We know that in California and across the nation, we've made significant progress in how we diagnose and treat cancer. Californians overall are living longer, but not everyone is benefiting equally cancer outcomes still vary widely, and how long you live may depend on your race or ethnicity, where you live, your income, or the type of insurance you have. We're gonna to talk today about those inequities and how researchers and others are trying to address them. If you're just joining us, please, if you have questions, please post them on the Facebook Live page and we'll get to as many as we can. Thank you so much. All right, let's start. Okay. Let's start with an overview. What do we know about cancer outcomes and survival rates? There's a lot we know. Um, I think perhaps one of the most important things to know is that it's looking better if you have cancer today. But let's just go back a, a little bit. Uh, cancer is, uh, in the last few years in California, has been either the top or the second leading cause of death. So it affects a lot of people. Uh, and that's pretty much true uh, nationally as well. And overall, it's becoming uh, more common, although survival uh, is getting better, and that's good. Um, but the benefit hasn't been even across the population. Some people are benefiting uh, more than others. And we'll get to that. So but first, which cancers, and I think you're right, it does affect so many people. I mean, everybody we know has, has somebody, had a relative or a friend who's had cancer. Which cancers have the best prognosis and which cancers have the worst? And, and that's often hard to answer. But let's just, uh, again, uh, just to, to make sure we're all in the same place, uh, cancer is not one disease. Uh, cancer is a whole lot of diseases, dozens and dozens of different types of diseases. Uh, we tend to uh, think about cancer according to where it occurs, breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, et cetera. But even when we, we think about it in those terms, there are often multiple different types. Uh, and the thing that, that correlates best with how you're going to do, to answer your, your question, mm -hmm. is how quickly it's picked up, uh, the stage at which the cancer is diagnosed. Uh, we know that some cancers, like prostate cancer, have a excellent uh, prognosis, uh, certainly picked up early, breast cancer, colon cancer, some of the uh, leukemias or lymphomas like Hodgkin's disease uh, have a very good prognosis if picked up early. So staging matters. What else determines and contributes to how long someone lives with cancer? Well, probably next to staging, um, uh, the next most important thing is if you get the right treatment. Uh, and uh, it's again, that's not uniform uh, across the population. There are some places where treatment, uh, according to established guidelines and, and what we know uh, works, uh, what in medicine we often typically call evidence-based uh, treatment, uh, and if you get that, then your chances of surviving uh, are much better. Th there's also other factors like your lifestyle uh, and um, how healthy you are to begin with, and uh, other risk factors, nutrition, smoking, exercise, you know, the other things that contribute to our health, uh, often more than healthcare per se. Okay, so even though, like you say, we're doing better than the past, there's still these wide gaps. So tell us about some of the most significant disparities, and obviously you've done some recent re research on this, and. Asians had the highest rates of survival for many of the cancers you studied, and African Americans had the worst overall prognosis. But tell us a little bit about the gaps. Well, again, it, it, depending on the, um, the specific cancer, uh, there are differences. Uh, among breast cancer, for example, uh, African American women uh, overall do less well than white women uh, or Asian women. Uh, we know that uh, with uh, colon cancer, uh, Hispanic men uh, 
often don't do as well as even Hispanic women or white men or women. Uh, and often that's because it's picked up at a later stage uh, in Hispanic men. Um, so there are disparities uh, according not just to ethnicity and, and race, but also and particularly uh, by socioeconomic status. Uh, and uh, overall, as a blanket statement, uh, people who are, are poor and, and economically challenged uh, do less well than uh, people who uh, are not in that situation. So that leads us actually perfectly to a question from uh, our audience, our viewers. And please remember to type in questions on our Facebook Live page and we'll get to as many as we can. But one of the questions is, what is being done to bring the best treatments to the poor? Well, um, candidly, not enough. Uh, but uh, we do know, for example, that if one is treated at a uh, designated uh, by the National Cancer Institute uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center, such as exist at all the University of California uh, medical centers as well as in other places, the likelihood of getting better uh, or, or surviving longer and getting more evidence-based treatment is higher uh, than if one um, is treated at non-such uh, designated centers. So uh, often it's a matter of being able to get into the place where you're most likely to get evidence-based treatment. And some of that, I would assume, has to do with what insurance you have, if you can even, if your doctors at an elite institution can accept you. And another question from, from our audience is, how many people can even take time off work to go to travel to these designated places, these higher quality places? Yeah, and, and that's a real problem. And, and, and too often, I think, uh, our healthcare system doesn't take into consideration uh, things like transportation. Uh, you can offer the best treatment uh, in the world, but if people can't get to you, uh, then it's not going to help them. And so certainly in, in today's world, we have to take a much more holistic view of, of healthcare and uh, address those things like transportation. Uh, equally important would be nutrition uh, and making sure that uh, when you're undergoing treatment, which often makes you feel lousy, uh, that you're also maintaining a, a good nutrition status, um, uh, that you're getting uh, an, an appropriate amount of exercise because we know that exercise is another one of those factors that increases your likelihood of a good outcome. Mm -hmm. The disparities are really complex. You mentioned yeah. socioeconomic status, uh, geography also plays a role. Uh, and one of the most striking studies that, of yours that, that I remember is the one that looked at insurance status and found that cancer patients in California who had Medicaid and the insurance for low-income residents were no better off than those who were uninsured. So why do you believe that was the case? Well, uh, I, I can't answer that as, with as much detail as, as I would like to, but um, just backing up a little bit to what you said, Clearly, having health insurance increases your odds of getting uh, good treatment. However, it's not that simple because not all health insurance uh, is the same. Uh, and so the, the better health insurance you can get, the more uh, inclusive and comprehensive, uh, uh, the, the better and, and the more likely that you'll end up in a place where you can get uh, evidence-based uh, treatment. But if you don't have health insurance, uh, that makes it more complicated. Uh, one of the things that we found which is puzzling and, and which uh, needs to be further explored is that in some cases uh, actually uninsured patients do better than uh, patients on Medicaid. That's surprising. Uh, which is surprising and doesn't at first blush make sense uh, and it's one of those unanswered questions right now as to why that, that happens but in either case being uninsured uh, or if you are on uh, Medicaid um, the survival statistics are not as good uh, as for individuals who have uh, private insurance, mm -hmm. uh, or I should say VA insurance or Department of Defense uh, sponsored insurance as, as well. And looking at geography, what do we know about how California's counties stack up or compare to one another? Well, we know that the um, rates of cancer are very different uh, among the counties. Some counties have uh, much higher rates of cancer uh, than others. Uh, however, what we can't uh, and haven't been able to tease out to date is exactly why. 
Is it because of uh, environmental conditions? Uh, is it because they uh, just lower rates of insurance? Uh, because the screening programs, public health uh, or other screening programs, are not getting people in uh, and so that their cancers are diagnosed at an early stage? Uh, is it because of higher uh, smoking rates? Uh, and, and there's a variety of other things. And, and those are still studies that need to be done they could be done, uh, but to date they, they haven't uh, been done. So you have your work cut out for you then. There's a lot of work that needs to be done to further ferret out how we get people uh, to have the best possible outcomes for cancer. So nationwide, some of these are, rep are, are all, we're seeing the same evidence nationwide. A new study that we linked to on the page came out today in JAMA that looks at counties across the nation and compared lower income, middle income, and higher income and found that lower income counties have higher death rates. And some of the, the factors that explained this that they found were in physical inactivity, food insecurity, smoking, and quality of health care, uh, some of which you just mentioned. So how could some of this help public health officials who are trying to address these gaps? Well, we, the things you just mentioned, and, and there's some others, there's kind of a, a menu of um, opportunities that if we could improve those things would not just improve cancer outcomes, but would improve health outcomes overall. Uh, and not to digress too far from the, the topic of, of this conversation, uh, but healthcare overall uh, has not done a, as good a job as it needs to do in addressing what we call the social determinants of health which are things like nutrition, uh, education, employment, uh, child the, the care, child care you know, all these things that actually, in, from a population health point of view, have more to do with how healthy is the population than healthcare per se. Uh, so we have to integrate our approach uh, to how we make sure they get the best possible healthcare with uh, making sure they also get uh, adequate nutrition, uh, exercise, other sorts of things that we know correlate with better outcomes uh, for cancer, but also better outcomes for multiple other conditions. Sure. I mean, all of this impacts diabetes, Heart disease, diabetes, right? uh, respiratory uh, conditions. I mean, it's all related. So some of it that you just spoke to is behavior, right? It's physical inactivity, smoking, but some of it is maybe where you live, like if you're exposed to environmental pollutants or air pollution. How do you balance both of those, and, and do both of them re ha it have an impact on cancer survival rates? Sure, although the, the connections there are not as well established as, as we would like to. Uh, but, you know, where you live. Um, if it's not safe to go out and exercise, uh, it may have less to do with the air pollution than the fact that it's just it's unsafe to you know, go around your neighborhoods and, uh, and, and get the exercise that you may want to do, but there are other reasons which make that difficult. So it's complicated and, and we need to uh, devote much more effort to understanding all these social factors and how they affect population health as well as healthcare per se. We have another question from a viewer, thank you, and you can post your questions on the Facebook Live page. We'll get to as many as we can. The question is, can you speak directly to disparities in survival for rural populations or Native American populations, of which we have a lot in California? We do. The, the, <clears throat> the Native American population in California is different than in most states because it's, uh, it's much more urban and, mm -hmm. and spread out throughout the population as opposed to being on, on tribal lands uh, per se. Uh, we don't have as, as good of um, information about uh, outcomes for Native American populations. We actually have some studies underway to try to better uh, answer some of those questions. But you see many of the same disparities there uh, according to different types of, of conditions. Uh, and it's often hard to, to sort out uh, whether some of that is, again, delayed uh, diagnosis, uh, you know, the cancers are picked up at a late stage or whether it's other factors like smoking and, and behavior and things like that. Uh, and in rural populations, uh, it's also, while I'd like to be able to give it a short, uh, quick answer to that, it's also complicated sure. <laughs> and also depends a lot on insurance uh, status and, and when uh, cancers are picked up uh, and a lot of the other factors that we talked about uh, already. We talked also about insurance and, and 
having insurance and the Affordable Care Act, of course, helped expand access to insurance for many low income Californians and, and Americans. Um, but how much does the quality of care that you get determine you, how long you're going to live with cancer? Not just that you're getting treatment or that yeah. you have access to a doctor, you have insurance, but the quality of the care that you're getting. Right. And, and we've actually done some studies which have, have looked at this. Uh, and uh, not all care is the same. Uh, it's clear that care at some um, hospitals, some institutions, is better uh, than at others, at least as, insofar as it follows the guidelines uh, and does the things, whether it's uh, surgical interventions or uh, chemotherapy interventions or, or radiation uh, treatment, whether they follow uh, the established guidelines uh, that have been developed based on the evidence as to what works. Uh, and um, it's heterogeneous uh, throughout the state, uh, i.e. It, it varies a lot among institutions how well those guidelines are, are followed. Um, clearly getting care at, as I already mentioned, at the uh, National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer centers increases the likelihood uh, that one will get evidence-based care which is not to say that you won't at, at other institutions, uh, but uh, it does tend to be more variable as we move into our communities. So another question from a viewer, and this is a big one, why do African Americans fare so poorly? Obviously there are poor Latinos, there are poor Asians, there are poor white people, so right? So why do African Americans fare so badly? And is there a role of biological differences uh, in, in some of these cancers, like the, the aggressive form of breast cancer? Mm -hmm. Again, I, I wish I could give a, a short and, and simple answer to that, and we don't know. And, and you know, African Americans um, do not necessarily have uh, worse outcomes for all types of cancers, mm -hmm. uh, but for uh, a, a number uh, of cancers. We uh, looked at this for 27 or so different types of cancer in California and found that uh, about nine of them, African Americans did not fare uh, as well. What hasn't been done, uh, and what we can't answer with certainty now, is it because they're more likely to be poor and, and not have access to care? Uh, we know that smoking rates, uh, for example, are higher uh, among uh, poor uh, populations, um, and including uh, some African American uh, populations. Uh, we know that other uh, social factors that we've talked about uh, the African American communities are uh, also disadvantaged. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, at this point, we can't answer with clarity that these are the four, five, uh, six reasons why this is a case. Uh, and it does call out for us to do both better studies, but also to address the uh, social factors that we know uh, are associated with worse, worse outcomes. Uh, as we're trying to ensure that they have access to the best medical care as well. Now, being out there as a reporter talking to folks about these issues, I also hear a, a lot about the mistrust and distrust mm -hmm. of the medical system for good cause, for yeah. how African Americans have been treated over the years. So I imagine that that plays in as well. But let me move on to kind of screening and treatment. Clearly, there's there are exciting developments, both in, in screening and better types of screening, but also in cancer treatments from gene therapy, precision medicine, and other developments. I, I don't want you to go into too much detail about those types of treatment, but does everybody have that same access to some of these exciting treatments? No. Uh, <laughs> Simply uh, said. Uh, in a word, uh, again, the access to the latest, and, and in many cases, very promising, uh, treatments, whether it's uh, immune therapy or some of the other uh, targeted therapies that are available today, um, often depends a lot on where you're getting seen. And, and again, uh, going back to something I've, I've said a couple times already, uh, at the, uh, uh, the larger uh, uh, comprehensive cancer centers, one is more likely to get those uh, sort of, of treatments, uh, the latest uh, and the most evidence-based treatments than at some other uh, facilities that are also treating cancer. Ideally, we would increase uh, the level of treatment at all facilities, uh, but to date, uh, there are disparities, if you will, in the uh, quality of, of cancer care that is provided 
uh, among our healthcare institutions across the state and across the nation. And it's expensive. Some of these new types of treatments are expensive. They're very expensive. So this is a perfect question to, to jump to from our audience. So would hospital X, any hospital, we won't name one, but will, will the, would they treat two cancer patients with the same disease differently if one had better insurance than the other or one had private insurance versus public insurance? I, I don't think that, they, uh, that any institution or, or any physicians would consciously uh, treat patients differently based on, on their insurance status. Uh, and I think it's a much more complex than saying you have Medi-Cal, therefore I'm going to give you a, a lesser standard of treatment than if you have private insurance. Uh, but clearly at, at some institutions that treat large numbers of Medi-Cal patients or uninsured patients, uh, there may be uh, uh, the, the practice or, or the quality of care may not be as well uh, as good as at some other institutions that treat more uh, uh, sure. patients with other types of insurance. The groups who have the worst outcomes are also less likely to take part in clinical trials. Yes. So treatments may not be specifically tailored to them. What gaps do we see in clinical tri trial prep participation and how does that impact outcomes? Well, I think much of it is embedded in, in what you uh, mm -hmm. said, uh, that these uh, clinical trials, which are uh, Another way of saying <clears throat> the, the bringing the latest and, and most advanced treatment and testing what works uh, better than others uh, among uh, uh, different groups of, of patients uh, is usually uh, relegated to your larger uh, comprehensive cancer centers or, or other uh, facilities that treat a, a large number of cancer patients. Uh, and the quality of care there is, uh, you know, as, as a broad and general statement, uh, tends to be a bit higher than at places that see fewer uh, number of cases and, and aren't involved in doing the investigative studies or the clinical trials that you referenced. So on solutions, let's turn to <coughs> solutions. So obviously the registry, which you helped create uh, in California, is a, is a way to help drive policy. And so can you just talk a little bit about the registry and what's in it and how, we, how it's being used to help address some of these gaps? Sure, uh, and in 1985, uh, I designated cancer as a reportable condition in, in California and then as a precursor to then establishing uh, the statewide cancer registry in 1988. So since 1988 uh, in California, we have collected information on every case of cancer uh, that occurs in the state, which to date is uh, well over 4 million uh, patients. And we're adding about 170,000 new cancer patients every year uh, to the registry. Uh, historically, uh, the cancer registry was used as a population tool. You know, uh, is cancer in Tehama County uh, more frequent than in you know, Solano County, or you know, pick whichever ones, uh, and which types of cancer are occurring more frequently. And it was usually used for those sorts of what we call surveillance. Uh, it's only recently that we've been a beginning to link the registry with actually clinical care and what goes on in hospitals and the treatment centers. And this is an area of a lot of activity right now as to how we use this population-based tool to actually inform and guide uh, the treatment that is going on uh, at hospitals, uh, as well as the outreach uh, to patients. How do we get more patients into clinical trials? Uh, and into screening as in, well. Into screening. I or mean, raising we, awareness. We did a report not long ago, which looked at every county in California and uh, what, 20 plus or so different types of cancer from the lens of where uh, are the gaps in screening. Uh, and it really provided a roadmap uh, from a county perspective as to where they should be stepping up their game on screening programs and for which types of, of cancer. Uh, and it's those types of things that the registry can be really helpful in. But we also think it can be very useful uh, in, uh, as a clinical tool as well. And we're trying to sort out how that best can happen literally as we speak. That's fascinating. I mean, yeah. it could be used both on the public health side and on the health care side to, to close these disparities. And, these and even more than that, uh, yes, we need to link it 
better, but we also need to link it with our, uh, for example, our environmental monitoring systems. We know that in some counties in the valley, for example, which have very high air pollution rates, uh, we need to be able to link that data with the cancer registry data to mm -hmm. try to answer questions about how much is that air pollution contributing to uh, cancer or certain types of cancer. Uh, we need to be able to do a better job of linking, uh, for example, around some uh, hazardous waste sites or, or uh, you know, other environmental uh, areas of environmental concern uh, with our cancer uh, uh, registry data. Uh, and with the clinical uh, system so that we can start integrating all this different information we have. I mean, in, in California, we are, we are advantaged in that we have a tremendous amount of information available. What we haven't done as good a job is linking it all together so that we can get a more uh, comprehensive, uh, or to use a California term, a holistic view <laughs> of, of what is happening uh, so that we can say, these are environmental conditions, this is what's happening with cancer, and this is what's happening clinically, and really be able to start managing our population health in a better way. So outside of the registry, what are some other efforts underway or efforts that should be underway to close this, these gaps and to bridge this cancer divide, whether it be getting more representation in research, uh, underrepresented re communities in research, or using more patient navigation and helping patients find their way to screening and treatment. I mean, what are some efforts that are underway in California? Well, let me just say th three things that immediately come to mind. <clears throat> we need to make sure everyone has health insurance uh, and uh, that they have health insurance that will make sure that they get access to um, uh, the best treatment that's, that's available. Secondly, we need to do a uh, better job of uh, screening uh, and getting people screened again. We know that the single most or, or best predictor of your outcome with a given type of cancer is how early that is picked up. And so at least for those cancers where there is a, a good screening tool or a method, we need to make sure that people are getting screened uh, so that their cancers are being picked up uh, at an, uh, as early a stage as possible. Uh, and third, we need to make sure that the uh, quality of care that's being provided uh, at all of the hospitals uh, that treat cancer uh, is uh, evidence-based uh, and conforming with uh, guidelines that we know are likely to yield good outcomes. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done there uh, across the state. When you talk about screening, that the cancers where there is, are good screening techniques or good screening tools, are we talking colorectal, um, breast cancer, what other types of cancers? Sure, I mean, breast and, and uh, colorectal uh, uh, are good, uh, prostate uh, is, is another. Uh, there are some cancers for which we just don't have good screening tools. Uh, lung cancer is one where there's uh, some emerging evidence that some of the new uh, sophisticated technologies uh, may be useful in that regard, uh, or at least for some types of patients, although the evidence is still not entirely clear uh, as to how beneficial that will be for, for all groups. Uh, but lung cancer is you know, one of the more common types of cancer that still does not have as good an outcome as we see in colon or, or breast or, or some others. Uh, because it tends to be picked up at a late stage. Right. So we get everybody insured, improve screening across the state and the nation, and improve the quality of care at cancer centers and, and hospitals that provide care. Those are three things that would certainly uh, take us a long way to getting better outcomes. There's a lot of other things uh, having to do with uh, improving the health of the population overall and doing the, some of the things that we've talked about as far as how you improve uh, your health status, and, and uh, uh, but certainly if we did those three things, and a lot of work has been done, and, and again, mm -hmm. I would be remiss if I didn't say that uh, the likelihood of having a good outcome uh, for cancer today is much better than it was 20 years ago. Right. So the news is good. We are moving in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction. We could be moving faster. We know the things that, that need to be done and that could be done to move us faster. We just have to find the, the right uh, incentives and, and things to catalyze us to move in that direction.
And of course, the topic of this whole conversation is ensuring that everybody has access to those uh, great treatments and that the the outcomes become more even across the board for different populations, right? I ideally, everyone would have access to not only access to care, but access to uh, the right care. Right. Well, we're gonna close on that thought. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser, for taking the time to talk to me. Uh, this video will be available on our website. Please share on Facebook and social media. And if you have other ideas for future Facebook Lives, please uh, let us know. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today with us.